Rangers have a high bar uh, to match from last year. So let's continue previewing it uh, with the great Jared Sandler joining us here on the DNM Leasing Hotline. Morning, Jared. How are we? Hey, okay, so 6.40, and they go back and listen to Peyton's song. Oh, my gosh, Dude. it's so good. He did Drake's back-to-back, and it was so good. Okay, I can't wait. Way to go, Peyton. You know, Peyton was the star of this segment last year when he said that anything less than 95 wins would be unacceptable, <laughs> and we were all kind of like, hey, Peyton, let's just, like, baby steps. Let's compete for a playoff spot in, you know, into September, and, uh, you know, look who – I mean, it, it didn't get to 95 wins. I Actually, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to give Peyton credit. Peyton, they didn't win 95 wins. Was last year unacceptable? Um, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. I mean, they, they should have won 95 games, but, you know, they collapsed in September, so that's all right. Got it. Okay. Well, well, you know, right. Jared, well, I'm, I'm, Jared, I'm sorry, Jared sorry. you may have just missed. Peyton just picked 89 wins and third in the West. I saw, I saw the, the tweet, and Peyton did, uh, in, in talking to me before we got on air, tell me that uh, 89 wins was his pick, so. Big old uh, hater. Clearly, he, yeah, he thinks that uh, the Rangers got significantly worse. Mm. All right, so set us set us up for today. You know, um, obviously, the 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 ceremonies out at the ballpark, everything that's going to happen, the raising of the banner, all the things. Set us up for that. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be pretty cool. I, I I think opening day is always really special, even the years in which you know you went into the season knowing that uh, it was more likely going to be ninety losses rather than ninety wins. Uh, opening day is always a lot of fun. Now, you know, this one, you go into opening day, it's the first opening day probably since 2016 where I think the majority of Rangers fans believe that this team can compete for World Series uh, because last year, I, I, you know, there was a lot of skepticism. They hadn't, they hadn't done anything close to that in a while. Uh, so there's that excitement, right? There's the excitement of starting the season knowing that you're, you're playing for something, uh, which – some might have felt that way last year, but I understand why not everyone did. And then on top of that, obviously, the excitement of being able to raise a banner. And if you think about it, uh, in DFW sports history, we've gotten to experience this on Christmas Day with the Mavs in mm-hmm. 2011. Uh, but that was after the, the lockout delayed the start of the season. We got to experience it in 2000 with the Stars after they won, or excuse me, in 99 with the Stars after they won in uh, earlier that June in 99. And then we've gotten to experience it a few times with the Cowboys, uh, but not for, you know, the, the uh, lifetime of a lot of young sports fans, right? So yeah, Not since the internet. This, yeah, so this is, uh, is going to be incredibly special. I, I, I can't wait. I don't know what to fully expect. I know, you know, they'll raise the banner. They'll introduce the team. Uh, but I, I would tell people this. If you're planning on going to the game. Yeah, what time are you going to get there? Like, yeah, I, I, I don't think that there's a time too early because – if you don't have a tailgate set up, you can just go to Texas Live. And there's a lot of cool stuff around the ballpark. If you want to go to the team store, get there early because lines are probably going to be really long. If you want to check out the new food items, uh, then you want to get there when gates open, I think at 3.30, uh, right, right for Rangers batting practice, I believe, which, you know, you don't always get to see all of Rangers batting practice with normal regular season gate opening times. So get there early. Uh, and be in your seats by, I'd say, six o'clock the latest if you want to experience the, you know, all the pomp and circumstance. So this is going to be incredibly special and uh, an opportunity. If you think about it, guys, there is the parade, yes, but it's the first time the Rangers are really going to be in in the ballpark with a a big crowd since winning the World Series, and so it'll be awesome to get to celebrate the 2023 team. Yeah, it is a uh, parking lot's open at two o'clock today. G Bag Nation will be out at the ballpark starting at two o'clock. They'll be there till six p.m. leading you up to pregame for the Rangers and the Cubs. And uh, gates open at three thirty, which is also, I think, what time batting practice starts for the Rangers. So, like, like you mentioned, Jared, like everybody will be able to if you get there early enough, you'll be able to get in there and, and view all the batting practice. Is there, just before we talk about like the specifics of the season, we were trying to, uh, we were kicking this around a little bit earlier talking about stuff. Is there any better day, even if, even when it's not a world series defending team, which is great. It, it, it levels it up all the more. Is there a better day in professional sports than major league baseball opening day? It just feels like, it feels like a holiday for everybody. There's so much optimism. I, it, it to me is just the most, it's the most perfect, reliable day every year on the sports calendar. Of like, that's going to be a great day. Yeah, I would say, I mean, obviously there's there's always a ton of excitement for the first week of college football or the NFL. But in terms of the, the, the production of the game, 
and the way the day plays out. You got games, you know, wire to wire uh, all day long, uh, and so many of them are nationally televised and available. Uh, and and I think if you go to the game, I, I don't know that there's a better first game of a season experience in sports than baseball. I mean, I went to the Stars opener this year, and it's cool. I mean, oh. it's great. It's not that, you know, it, it's not that much different. Yeah, they announced the players sick. <laughs> uh, it, you know, NBA, the, the first game of the NBA season, same thing. It, you know, they announced the, the, you know, the whole roster. Pretty cool. Great. Uh, the, the pomp and circumstance, the, the, the way that baseball just makes such a, a, a production out of opening day is really, really special. I, I don't know that there's a, a cooler opening day experience in sports yep. than going to a baseball game. I only went to one as a fan. Uh, and I was late to that because I, I had to get out of school. Uh, it was against the Angels. And as you can imagine, Vladimir Guerrero, I think, had uh, a home run and an RBI double before I even got in the building. Uh, mm. But, I, you know, I, I had friends who every year, they, they, you know, it was a tradition with their family. They'd go to opening day. I had a teacher, Mrs. Haygood. She'd take off that day at school because she would go to opening day every year. And uh, I understand why so many people make it a tradition. It's incredibly special. Yep. And uh, I hope – I hope a lot of people listening are able to make it out today. Yeah, it is just different. Like everything, like you said, I mean, there's so much more pomp and circumstance. Because the game itself, like, it's one of 162. It's, it has very little impact on your season. NFL, I mean, opening week, I mean, that's it, it's one one sixteenth of a season. I mean, right, as opposed to one one sixty second. But there's no comparison. Because, you know, game two, Brett Boone yesterday told us that the second game is like okay, now the grind starts, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's just it's just very very different. Okay, uh, so there's been a lot of issues we've talked about in the off season, um, be it from injuries to pitching, you know, starting rotation, whatever. What's been the most overrated um, sort of talking point of the off season? If you could if you could pick one. Well, I think if I get really specific. Uh, I think the, the the concerns about the starting pitching have been maybe misguided in that okay. I don't think that the current rotation, and if you want to add Michael Lorenzen in, into the mix as well when he's ready, I don't think the current rotation is, is you know, it should be the biggest concern. It's not an elite rotation right now, one through five. I think the concern should more be about the depth, right? We've talked about this. So I think I think some people have just generally expressed concern about the rotation, and I guess that's not that's not off base because the depth is uh, is, is a part of that conversation. But right now, the guys they have in the rotation, you know, if they stay healthy, Evaldi Gray, you know, what we we saw with the way they use Andrew Heaney last year and Dunning and Bradford, and, and hopefully you get uh, you know first half Michael Lorenzen. That's a competitive group because this lineup has a chance to be way better than it, it was last year. And then the other thing that was a little overrated, I don't know for sure how it's going to play out, but I think from some people there's this thought that, well, Evan Carter won't hit lefties. And he, you know, I think people need to remember, Evan Carter is younger than Wyatt Langford. He has not had a ton of uh, you know, sample size experience hitting lefties. I'm not saying that Evan Carter is going to be a 300 hitter against lefties this year. But what I do think is that you need to give this guy some time uh, to to take his lumps, to get the experience of, of facing major league lefties. He really did not get a ton of experience in doing that last year. And there will be growing pains, but I don't think that you can just close the book and say, well, you know, Evan Carter's not going to be able to hit lefties. I think that a part of what makes guys special as baseball players or athletes in general is their ability to make adjustments, their ability to take their weaknesses and if not turn them into strengths, turn them into items of, I guess, neutrality, if, you know, for lack of a better word. And I think that this guy's going to be able to do that. You just got to give him some time. Uh, so that was something that I just thought it was odd that we were putting a ceiling on a 21-year-old phenom like Evan Carter without really giving him a chance to show for sure that he can or can't do something. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. When you mentioned that specifically, Jared, the idea of Carter hitting lefties, I remember there was a – one of the articles last year, I think Jeff Passan had written when he, you know, was covering the Rangers as they were, you know, having the success they were, was he was talking about like the impact of Bochi and like the belief that Bochi has in players to see them through stuff that people don't believe they can. 
So like Jankowski, he used as an, as an example where Travis Jankowski said, like, nobody ever believed in me to even get a shot against lefties. And like Boach gave me the opportunity a couple times last year. And like the very first time he got the opportunity, it was like a two, three hit game or whatever else. And Jankowski just talked about like what a, a big thing that was for him in terms of a confidence boost and, and things like that. So when we talk about like what Evan Carter's capable of or what anybody on this roster, these questions we would have, like it feels like Bochy somebody who's going to give them the space to work those things out. Yeah, and I, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Bobby, because I think it, it, it's a tough thing to to quantify. Uh, and I understand a part of what's awesome about being a fan of baseball and the, the conversation that goes along with it is that maybe in baseball more than any other sport, you can really debate – lineup decisions, you know, batting order, who should start, who shouldn't, all right? You know, in, in the NFL, you want to debate the starting running back, who cares? You know, mm-hmm. it's, you're, you know, it, okay, so Tony Pollard starts this, you know, starts the game, but he might only get, you know, 55% of the snaps, stuff like that. We're not, how often are we really debating starting quarterbacks on good teams, you know? So, you know, you, you have these discussions in baseball. I mean, it's, if you, if you don't start, you're on the bench. It's not like we have running substitutions like you do in other sports. And, I think one of the things that sometimes gets lost is, is Bobby, what you talked about is uh, when a manager is loyal to a player, doesn't guarantee results. I mean, Bruce, Bruce Bochy could somehow get stuck with me on the roster and he has to, you know, I, I, he's going to be loyal to me. I'm still going to hit. Oh, 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 right. He can be as loyal to me as he wants, but I'm not getting hit off major league pitching. And I use that as an exaggerated example to say that it doesn't always pay off. But I think sometimes we forget that, you know, these aren't robots. These are humans. And whether it's for that individual player, the Travis Jankowski example you use, or his teammates who notice how he's treating Travis Jankowski, a loyal manager, when all is said and done, is going to end up getting more out of his players than someone who's going to knee jerk like we as fans all want to do and pull someone the minute they show any, you know, any sign of slumping. Because then what happens to players is they have in their head well, shoot, if I have like three straight games without a hit, you know, I'm, I'm out of there. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to move around. I'm not going to get to play. And I think, I think that's a part of what makes Bruce Bochy special is he knows how these guys are wired and he understands that, I, yeah, when everyone is, is yelling at me to pull Marcus Simeon from the leadoff spot in the playoffs, I'm going to be loyal to this guy because he is a veteran who helped get us to this point. I believe he's going to turn things around. And guess what? Marcus Simeon led the team in hits in the World Series out of the leadoff spot, right? So, you know, I think these things really do play a role, and I think it's a part of what makes Bruce Bochy special as a manager is his understanding of that. You know, all the different times that we've had you on, uh, Jared, leading up to this opening day here, I still don't think one of the things we've talked about with you has been this new pitch that uh, Dane Dunning has incorporated, the fork ball, which... I, I, I know he had talked. That's about a throwback. It. You don't hear guys throwing fork balls that often anymore. Hey, he's gonna he's gonna Kevin Apier it. It's we're gonna be good. Uh, but the he, I know he talked about like testing around the grip, like just playing catch during the uh, the playoff run. Decided he liked it. But how are we making a little bit of this? I know there's been some conversation about ooh this new pitch from from Dane Dunning. But do you think that's gonna be something we're we're gonna see consistently worked into the mix for him? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it did look pretty good in, in spring. I know in his uh, his penultimate start, I think he got two or three strikeouts off the fork ball. Uh, and I think he used it all right on what, what day was it? Tuesday when he pitched. Uh, I don't know to what degree, you know, he'll break it out. But one of the things that Dane, you know, needs to improve upon is just to get a, a little more swing and miss. Uh, you know, I don't know that Dane's ever going to be a big time strikeout pitcher, but you know, it's never a bad thing if you can add the, the strikeout to your game, you know, at a higher degree. And uh, I think he, you know, feels like, hey, that, that slider, uh, that helps him, especially against righties. But, you know, one of the things with whether it's a forkball or a splitter, because they're, they're essentially the same pitch, uh, slightly different grip. But most of the time they're platoon neutral pitches, which means that as a righty, you can have success with that pitch. Uh, when you face righties and lefties, you know, Mike Basick brought up a great point about the, you know, the splitter slash work ball in, in that, you know, with, with guys who are good changeup pitchers, that's awesome, but you really don't throw that pitch same side. So righties don't often, there are only a few pitchers who have a lot of success as righties throwing that pitch to righties or lefties to lefties, but 
you can you can throw the splitter as kind of a, a substitute for that pitch or the fork ball, and that allows you to, to, to throw that one pitch to both righties and lefties typically, right? That, mm-hmm. That's just what the data shows. The splitter in general, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll just use splitter as a term to include the fork ball, uh, was thrown more last year than any year ever in the pitch tracking era. Now, it was only a little over 2% of the time, but that was about a 50% jump from the previous high. And I expect that number to rise this year. As, as all sports do, uh, baseball and, and its trends are cyclical. And there used to be this thought that, well, the splitter is going to get me hurt, and that's why guys stop throwing it. But I think data has shown that there's nothing to prove that that's the case. The splitter was the most effective pitch in baseball last year. Uh, it was the toughest pitch to hit. It, it overtook the slider. It overtook the elevated fastball. Hitters are starting to make adjustments on the elevated fastball. It's still a really good pitch, not as dominant as it was a year, two years, three years ago. The splitter is in part really effective because of what I mentioned earlier. It is only thrown about 2% of the time. Hitters do not see that pitch a ton. So eventually there's going to be an oversaturation, but we still might be two, three years away from that. So guys who throw the splitter uh, tend to have a little bit of an advantage because it's not a pitch you see very often. More and more pitchers are starting to adopt a splitter or a splitter variation like the forkball. And one of the guys who's been one of the best at throwing the splitter in baseball over the last six, seven years is the guy who's going to take the mound tonight, and that's Nathan Avaldi. That was such a big pitch for him, uh, and uh, you know I expect it to be a big part of his success this year. Jared, I know one of the things you, when you were kind of anticipating the roster and trying to you know uh, talk through what was going to happen, you said like, hey, the bullpen is – like there, there's no telling how that thing's going to shake out and and what they're going to ultimately decide on that front for the opening day roster. Just preview for us a little bit. Give us a a capsule of of you know the bullpen decisions, where they're at, and and what they have there with the pen, especially since a lot of the discussion is just centered around the starting rotation. Yeah, I, so th- there's there's a portion of the pen that is going to be just like all major league bullpens, a little bit of a a shuttle service, you know, Yeri Rodriguez made the team to start the season. He earned it with a great camp, but uh, you know, what happens if in game two, uh, you know, the, the Rangers have to go to the bullpen early and they, they use Yeri Rodriguez for three innings and now they need to make sure that they've got, you know, fresh arms. Yeri Rodriguez is optionable. So you could, you know, send him down. Maybe Grant Anderson comes up. Uh, the Rangers early on in the season have a 17 game and 17 day stretch. So they're going to need protection. So every bullpen, uh, more often than not, will be built with a couple of optionable guys who you can, you know, send back and forth as needed. Uh, So they've got that portion uh, in the bullpen, and Jake Latz and Ari Rodriguez are in spots, uh, and maybe they're they're here wire to wire. uh, But you know, I think with any bullpen, you also got to remember. Uh, that it's just like the rotation. It's not just the eight guys who make the open day roster you're going to rely on. It's you know probably four or five guys, maybe even more than that, uh, over the course of the season. So even though Grant Anderson and Mark Church and some others didn't make the team, Jesus Tinoco, uh, those guys are likely going to have to get some big outs for the Rangers at some point this season. And, and, and maybe even a guy we have, we're not even talking about, like Grant Anderson last year. We were not talking right. about Grant Anderson at this time last year. And he ended up, you know, helping the Rangers when they, they needed some help in the middle of the season. Uh, I, I think the big question is, how are the late innings going to shake out? So we think that Jose LeClerc is going to get a bulk of the save opportunities early on. Who's going to give you the eighth? Who's going to give you the seventh? You know, if you're trying to protect a one-run lead, how much of it is going to be matchup-based? How much of it is going to be inning-based? You know, Bruce Bochy, you know, uh, managed in an era where you had a guy pitch the seventh, a guy pitch the eighth, a guy pitch the ninth. But – uh, we've, you know, we, we've seen that, you know, Bruce Bochy uh, adjusts, right? He's not, you know, set in his, his ways. Uh, and so last year we saw some of it be more matchup based. Kirby Yates is a righty, but lefties just do not touch him. I think right. they barely hit over 100 against him last year. So maybe when you get through the sixth inning, if you're looking ahead at the, the lineup and you see that the eighth has a chance to be more lefty heavy uh, for the opposing team, maybe Kirby Yates gets the eighth that night. And maybe it's Josh Spores in the seventh or David Robertson, whatever it might be. The other thing that's interesting, guys, is the Rangers have a closer or a presumed closer in Jose LeClerc, who's not one of these guys who's like, I have to close. Uh, and, and, and not that there's anything wrong with that, because you can make an argument that, hey, you want a closer that says the ninth inning is mine. Get the heck out of the way. I own those three outs. Uh, 
Uh, Josh Hader basically said that when the Astros acquired him. Said, no, I'm the closer. It's not Ryan Presley. It's me. Not the guy who's helped this organization win a couple World Series. And you know what? Hey, if you back up, back that up with the results, that's, that's fine. There's also value in maybe a guy like Jose LeClerc. Uh, because if egos are not going to get in the way, that makes it a lot easier for Bruce Bochy to, to perhaps mix and match even in the ninth inning, much like the Mariners did two years ago uh, with Andres Munoz and Paul Seawald and Eric Swanson and, uh, and, and, and the group of relievers Scott Service had. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see a few different guys get opportunities in the ninth inning, uh, but I do think it's going to be Jose LeClerc to start the season. Hey, we appreciate it, man. Have fun out there tonight. Enjoy the uh, the first banner raising, the Rangers opening day of the defending World Series champs. Uh, talk to you later, man. Hey, thanks, fellas. Bye. Love you, Jared. Jared Sandler, 6 o'clock pregame right here. 105 to the fan. Rangers and Cubbies opening day. Oh.